Thank you so much again for being here. Uh, we've got some lovely panelists here today. We've got Dr. Amal Hussain, we've got Dr. Byron Lowens, and also Dr. Alex Reichter. Um, I will let each of them introduce themselves and talk to you about, in general, what their piece of the pie is in this larger pie of wearables. And um, before we get started, I'm gonna bring your attention to a couple of things that I wanna do a little bit differently. Um, for those of us who are a bit nervous about asking questions, there will be an anonymous way to pop your questions up there. I will check them from time to time so that I can ask your questions. Certainly, if you feel like you want to raise your hand and have a conversation with any of our panelists, please feel free to do that. There's, there's freedom here to do that. Before we, get, we begin, I want to thank uh, Jeanette and Justin Hinckley for their work um, and their support for our college and in making this happen today and also for their support to the college in general. There are other key players in the background as well. I will thank them later. Um, thank you so much again for being here. So let me start with our panelists, if each of them can introduce themselves. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Amel Hussein. I am the Director of Research at the Council on Social Work Education. Um, I work there remotely, um, directing the research agenda for the social work profession. Uh, we are the accrediting body for all of the social work programs in the country. I'm also a part-time faculty at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, where I teach human behavior and research methodologies for both undergraduate and graduate students. And I absolutely love research and sharing my passion for research with my students. Um, so I'll pass it on to my colleague, Byron. All right, uh, I'm Dr. Lowens. Uh, beautiful crowd here, glad you all are able to be for this talk. Uh, so I'm Dr. Lowens. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Michigan. I study privacy and wearables. Um, so most of my research kind of looks at trying to understand the cooperative relationship between technology and humans, um, not just how we use technology, but how technology impacts us um, from a social perspective. Um, I'm also a associate, not associate, assistant professor at the University at Virginia State University um, in the computer science department. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for thanks, Lindsay, for um, inviting me. And I'm Dr. Allison Reichter. I am an assistant professor here in the Department of Kinesiology at Louisiana Louisiana Tech. And my research focuses on motivational strategies to promote physical activity and other healthy behaviors. And uh, my contribution here is how wearables can be one of those motivational tools. Thank you so much, panelists. I really appreciate that. So unlike what we do typically, what I'd like for you to do is, if you can um, and are willing, would you join um, Slido.com if there's a number, or what you can do is with your smartphone, if you pull out your camera app or your QR code app and copy that or kind of face it and click it, it should, um, it should ask you those questions. Let's see if I can move on to live polls. The first question on there is, please name the wearable that you have interacted with in the past week. We already have our first technological difficulty here, just a moment. And as you answer, a few things should pop up on the screen there, and we'll get an idea of what your comfort level is with wearables. Yeah, we've got a few things there, smartwatch, Apple Watch, iPhone. What else? What's technology that you wear or have worn in the past week? Yeah. One not applicable, fair enough. I haven't heard 
it have be before? All right, so we've got quite a few smart watch watches there. Um, what do you use your wearable for? Is it for monitoring steps? Could it be for gaming? Could it be for fitness tracking? tracking, music, text messages, absolutely, health goals. Listening to audiobooks. Steps, music. Quite a few things popping up here. Appreciate your participation, everyone. While we're doing this, let's ask our panelists. In your opinion, what is a wearable? We've got a couple of examples up here, so if you want to mention anything that we haven't considered as an audience, please let us know. So, you know, the question first, what is a wearable? What is a wearable? Uh, a wearable is anything that you can gather personal data from that's about yourself, um, about yeah, human data. Yeah, I would say a wearable is a, anything that a computerized device that can be worn on your body for some specific purpose, whether that's for entertainment purposes, fitness purposes, to track data, um, anything like that. Um, I have a question for the audience, though. You all know the difference between a smartwatch and a fitness tracker. Smartwatch or a fitness tracker? Smartwatch. All right, so who owns a Fitbit? So would you say a Fit? Well, I guess you would have to say the type of Fitbit. So the, the type of Fitbit you want, maybe a smartwatch or a fitness tracker. So there's a difference, right? So a fitness tracker is strictly, strictly for tracking fitness. It does it for you can do text messages, you can check stocks, you can do it for a smartwatch. It has all these Compose features where you can compose for data to not only track your fitness, but you can also send text messages, look at stocks, um, all types of things. So, little distinction there. Because um, I was running a study, and one thing that I noticed people were mis-inadvertently crossing the two things. So, hopefully, that made it a little bit more sense. Yeah, I'd say uh, I define it as a portable um, device that you to New Brunswick were closed um, and I had very little time to get to my students before they were going to leave um, and so using my phone I was able to reach and communicate with all of them and let them know okay I'm running a little late because all the roads are closed um, and they waited and we had our session as planned um, so you know using it in that fashion was very helpful to disseminate my message to my class in a timely way. So you bring up apps. Would you say that there's been a great emergence of apps in the last five years? And question for everyone here, how has this field changed in the last five years? Um, I think these devices have gotten smarter over the last five years. So if you look at the advancement of technology over the last year, I mean, things have changed talk about five years, that's equivalent to like probably about 20 years. So um, there they are you know, more advanced in collection, um, whereas you know, five years ago, if you had a wearable, it was just tracking your 
some steps. Um, now your world will be telling you that you're not getting enough sleep, that you're gonna get moody the next day, um, stuff like that. Um, there are also um, other types of uh, things like AI, machine learning, where it can uh, develop models that specifically to you, whereas, like I said, five years ago, it was just tracking steps. But now, wearable, if you wear a device you know, longer than a couple of weeks, it creates a personalized model for the device and then you could give it to somebody else and where it at now if you give your device to another person that device will know that that isn't you and it'll be trying to customize those features so there's a lot that has changed i mean it's been a significant change over the past five years and the things that i'm just saying is you know scratching the surface um yeah i mean a lot of things have been um, a lot of doors have opened up with all of the updates um, certainly help us reach people at a faster rate. Um, and so I agree um, in the past five years. And you know, five years ago when I started teaching, I did not have an app for Canvas to reach my students. Um, and now it just makes my life a lot easier when I'm juggling um, a lot of different things. I can um, easily grade um, using my phone. I can reach out with announcements and inform my students about some changes um, in a really instant way, which was not possible five years ago. So I'm really thankful And I think another piece kind of going along with accessibility is the user friendliness of that data. So how easy it is to interpret that on, on the apps uh, that we're using that connect our devices to, to us, whether it's through our phone or through some other medium. Yeah, and one more thing that's changed is the form factor. So typically, so when wearables first came out, especially for health tracking purposes, usually wore a strap. Then they went to wearing it on the wrist. Um, and I think there was some that you could wear it on your ankle. Um, but now they have head mounted devices where you can wear it with glasses. Um, they also have wearables that you can put in your ear. Some of these devices that you can put in your ear can track your heart rate, um, it can track your exercise. Um, now they have a device that you can wear a little bit of ring um, that can track sleeping and other health components. So a lot of the form factors have changed with that. And I think as time, as is form factor will continue to change. So, you know, what you're wearing on your wrist right now just may seem a little freaky to a little people, a uh, little bit, but what's on your wrist may be inside your wrist or tattooed on your arm to collect that same information. So devices are becoming more miniaturized, they're becoming a lot smaller, but the computational power is increasing. So um, yeah, that's just something to think about. I know it sounds a little crazy to think about a tattoo of a You've all mentioned data in different ways. Can you elaborate on that? What data is stored in certain wearables and how does this data collection help people? So I guess to start, uh, I mean, we get personal information. So um, kind of your background, you know, whenever you set up your app or your device, it's asking for name, email, et cetera. Then all of the data that whatever device you're wearing says it um, is going to track, going to collect. If you're wearing a Fitbit, it's going to track your steps. It's going to track what type of activity you're doing, um, whether it's through accelerometer form. So it's getting um, vector data about how much you're moving and how quickly you're moving. Um, and then I'll, I'll leave it in kind of pass along to my colleagues for more information on what's actually being collected with other types of wearables. Yeah, it just depends on the device. So there's a lot of things in the uh, track that you know, uh, the panel has mentioned. Heart rate, um, blood oxygen levels. And I think this was a really important thing during the pandemic. Um, blood, like I think lower blood oxygen levels were a big indication that people um, had COVID-19. So, you know, now your wearable can kind of detect that um, sleep um, and it can be able to give you insights. I read an article lady, she had a, her husband bought her an Apple Watch for Christmas, um, and they kept sending her these notifications about her heart rate. Um, so the, there's a disclaimer that most of these devices tell you it can't detect AFib and it can't detect a, well, it's not designed to be 
detect a heart, a heart attack or a fib, but it can detect irregularities in your heart rate. So she noticed some irregularities in her heart uh, uh, measurements. So she went to her doctor and come to find out she, if she didn't go to the hospital when she went, she would have had a heart attack and died. Um, so she was that device actually. seems as if it's on the device, but it's actually not. It's actually processed, and then you can look at a lot of the data on your phone. It's actually not a physical device. The device just has sensors to collect it. You got um, So in um, my world, the uh, data that's collected is related to the students' um, analytics, so how many minutes they use on the platform. For example, my learning management system that I usually work with is Canvas, um, and it tells me what hours my students, how long they've spent, reading the material. I also, um, for academic integrity issues, I get a percentage on the turn it in of how much percent this is um, looking like some other um, work that has been published outside. So it also helps us um, you know, detect academic integrity issues, which I take very seriously. Um, and you know, all of this is being stored and collected within the link application, so it's helpful for me to monitor. In this space of monitoring a lot of things, collecting a lot of data, what thoughts do you have about security and the challenges in that space? Um, yeah, how can we? How can they be addressed? So one of my main concerns about data and security is a who owns that data. Um, you would think that you're filling out your profile and it's your information that's being logged in there. But uh, reading the fine print, you don't always own that data that you have. And what if you know, you're wearing a device, stop wearing it, what happens to that data? What happens to that information that's being gathered? Um, those are some of the you know, first line issues with, with security to, to really think about. Yeah, this is, a really good question, right? Um, this is something that I've studied a lot. Um, so, show of hands, who's ever seen a doctor before, right? So when you go to a doctor, what's the first thing that they collect from you for a checkup? Your right, your vitals, right? Where is that information stored? In an electronic health record. Um, HIPAA has standards on the protection of that information, right? So no one can get access to your heart rate, your blood pressure, your weight, none of that stuff. A wearable is collecting the same exact information, but it's outside, it's extra clinical data, so it's outside of a, a clinical setting, it's on a consumer device. HIPAA laws don't protect consumer data. So anything that you collect on a wearable device isn't protected by HIPAA. Um, and that's the issue especially as it relates to hip health care. Um, so that poses a, a myriad of other issues. What's being done with that data? Who has access to that data? What are they doing with that data? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, your wearable will collect location information, right? So how many runners are in here? Show of hands, how many, how many, how many, and this is, this is something that's very important to me, how many women All right, so um, how many women run? So if you're running, right, your wearable device is capturing your location information. So a stalker, if they want, they can get a hold of that information and know when you're taking your runs and potentially follow you on your runs, know when you're not at home and potentially go to your house, hide out, so all of that, that's an extreme security risk, right? especially to people with that information. Also, um, we don't know what's being done with this data. And 
making sure potentially, like say for instance, we're you know a lot of students in this are sitting in front of the computer a lot, so we're sedentary for an extended period of time. Um, so over time, if your device notices that person isn't standing up, if a health insurer provider, the health insurer's insurance provider gets a hold of that information, in the future they can say, hmm, we have this data, a third party, uh, an insurer has bought your information from a third party, and they say, hmm, this person is really sedentary in their 20s, more than likely they're going to get sick. We're going to shoot up their insurance rates uh, because of that. So, that's where we get it. It's just massive amounts of information. Um, no one really knows where that information is going. Nobody knows what's being done with that information. You can't really see what's being done with that information. So it's massive collection of information that has extreme amounts of privacy implications to a lot of people that we're not really aware of and we're not controlling in a method that's conducive to protecting our privacy. Hope I didn't scare anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you so much. <laughs> no, 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 we've got lots more questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are there other big challenges in this area of wearable technology at the moment? Uh, there's a lot of challenges. Yeah, I think there's a lot of challenges, right? So uh, extended battery. So they're collecting this information. So say you're in a situation where you need the device to constantly collect the information. So one of the challenges, one of the big challenges that I've always been is when I take the device, like for example, if my doctor needs a continuous response to my heart rate, but the device dies and I need to put it on the charger, how is my heart rate now being tracked if my device is on the charger, if I'm not wearing it, or the battery dies, or if you know a patient needs fall detection. If the battery dies, that person, that information can't be um, detected. So, you know, longer battery life, um, security, um, integration, integrating that device with other things, depending on what you want. So there's a there's a lot of challenges that a lot of people are working on. And, well, you know, there are, and then, you know, obviously the security and privacy challenges are, are big. Yeah. So I'll, I'll brighten us up a little bit, um, <laughs> something more optimistic. So we can use these um, new advances in our technology to improve like engagement with students in the classroom. And so I've found um, different ways that we might do that uh, that were really helpful and impactful for my students. So for example, there's a site called Perugal. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of this one. Any, raise your hand if you've uh, had any interaction with Perugal. Okay, not clearly. Okay, in the back, great. <laughs> so um, basically I was able to uh, identify a problem I was noticing in my classroom. Students were not doing the assigned readings and I wanted to address that. So I used this platform, it's a reading platform, where I could upload the course reading and instead of assigning them to uh, summarize those readings, I could make it uh, more of a sense of community um, with my in-person class so that they're talking to their peers directly on the reading. And so I would upload these uh, PDFs that were normally just accessible through the LMS, the learning management system. And then students were annotating directly on there and having very like intense conversation about the reading and doing the reading while you know, commenting on their peers, while bringing in other outside sources, um, linking TED Talks and other things that other sources of media that they've encountered that were relevant to the discussion um, and then they were coming to class much more prepared, which I loved um, seeing that. Um, and we piloted this um, in the spring. So I had the same group of students in the fall, and I noticed a huge difference in the spring after doing this. Um, so we can use these as instructors in the academy to really enhance the engagement and the depth of the learning that's taking place in our classroom. Um, and I think this is a huge uh, opportunity for us to engage in the classroom in a way that's more, you know, palpable for students and the instructor. <laughs> there are some really interesting features on Perusal as well for the instructor. So very time-saving things like grading itself. So I could program this to uh, assign a grade and it would all my grades would get imported in my gradebook in Canvas, which is very, um, you know, a time-consuming task otherwise. Um, and, you know, it, it really was a very um, useful tool that I um, had a really great experience with and students really loved 
Um, so my uh, assignments only required them to post five posts, um, two of them being responses to their peers, and they went way beyond the, the minimum, right? And so there was so much interaction happening online. I couldn't upvote the, um, something that I saw that was really profound um, and really recognize students, and it was really a great positive reinforcement for the person receiving that praise. Um, and so all the students kind of re really excelled in that way, and I, I just find it really remarkable that we could really change the way the classroom is um, you know, set up to utilize the technologies and you know, benefit the whole dynamic. But that's my two cents. <laughs> and I can add uh, a little bit more uh, kind of thinking about some of the different utilization for, for better or for worse. Uh, one aspect is how one device talks to another. Uh, so for example, I have type one diabetes. I have two things on me that are related to that. One is an insulin pump, another is a continuous glucose monitor. Until a couple years ago, there was no way for them to be able to communicate. And so when I was first diagnosed, uh, I was diagnosed in my early 20s, everybody asked me, you're wearing these two things, can they talk to one another and make a decision? Answer was no. Now technology has continued to progress, they can talk to one another, and that's improving the blood sugar control of not just me, but the millions of people out there with diabetes who are wearing uh, this technology as well. So the connection between devices huh, has the ability not only to give us more information about our health, but actually use that information to improve the health outcomes. Allison, could you also talk a bit about your work in um, the intersection between wearables and motivation and behavioral change? Sure, yeah, so uh, part of my work focuses on how do we get people to start being physically active, and once they are active, how do we get them to stay? A lot of my work has utilized Fitbits as a motivational tool and when I'm working with our interventionists who are communicating with our participants, clients, uh, patients about this technology, we have used it as a, a way for them to set realistic behavioral goals. So for example, I saw up there to get me to 10,000 steps. That's awesome, 10,000 steps might not be an appropriate goal for somebody who's new to being physically active. 5,000 steps might be a really tall ask for a lot of people. And so we can utilize the data or the, you know, these devices to meet and set appropriate goals for where people are and then continue to use that information so once that person who 5,000 steps was a lofty goal, and if they're now starting to get there, we can change the goals in, on that device, in that app, and then we can make those goals progressively more difficult, more challenging to help improve that particular behavior. The data themselves itself is also a great way to communicate between the patient, the person who's trying to change their behaviors, and their provider, whether it's their doctor, their health coaches, which is the sphere that I live in, about their behaviors in real time. So we're able to see on you know, last Tuesday, you hit 12,000 steps. What was going on last Tuesday? What helped that work so well for you? Um, and we're able to have conversations about those, those particular behaviors. On the other side of things, using this device as you know, really goal driven, that can be an extrinsic reward. A lot of people want to wear it just to hit a particular number. That's probably not going to have a lot of staying power. You know, we might you know, lose, lose battery. It, it might malfunction in some way, shape, or form. If we're so attached to the numbers that we're collecting, then we aren't actually going beyond that information in order to you know, make those long-term changes. And so there's definitely some great features to wearables as this motivational tool, tool, communication tool, but if 
you're only focused on the numbers or not actually focused on the whole person and their the entirety of their behaviors. Because the companies that make those devices have ensured that it will be. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, the question was, I'm wearing uh, medical devices that collect my blood sugar, collect uh, my insulin information. Um, if and when I'm sharing or sharing that with my provider, are those protected by HIPAA? Does that mm -hmm. uh, go? Yes, because the device company. Uh, doctor recommended the devices, but the, the manufacturing yeah. um, manufacturers and set those protocols in place. And that's another thing, like your doctor can recommend, like this is a medical device, or like if she's wearing a medical device, now if your doctor recommends, hey, you should get a Fitbit to track your steps, or an Apple Watch to track your steps, if your doctor doesn't prescribe the device, it's still a consumer device. So if you're, like, if you, if you don't get it through your provider, it's still a consumer How do you balance the um, the intrinsic motivation with the extrinsic motivation? The extrinsic motivation coming from all the, the numbers and data, intrinsic motivation being the internal desire for that personal behavior change or whatnot. Uh, it is a fine balance. If I had all of the answers, uh, I probably would uh, not be sitting here. I, I'd be making a whole ton of money about it. That, that link. Uh, when looking at, again, that inordinate amount of, of data, it really comes down to, say, per, personal capacity. It's like you said, you, you decided to stop wearing those devices because uh, it got overwhelming. Uh, each individual had, first, I guess, Kind of uh, kudos to you has to know themselves really well. Sometimes you don't know yourself until you're seeing all of this and oh my goodness, I'm being consumed by it. Uh, I can say I, at first, when I started wearing the continuous glucose monitor for my blood sugars, I was the exact same way. Uh, it got overwhelming. I was tracking, I was looking at, well, not my watch at that point, but I was looking at the device every five minutes to see what happened. I can see my my life in real time right now. And that became, as you said, overwhelming. Uh, the kind of the shift that I was able to make that a lot of the participants who have gained uh, you know, this, this device that allows them all this new information, they were able to be successful because they started to put limits on it, uh, self-defined limits. And they accomplished that through a lot of trial and error. Um, and so some, some participants, I know that after the study with us ended, they stopped wearing that Fitbit because they realized it became too overwhelming for them. Um, others were really gung-ho about the data at, start, at the start, and then they started setting goals around limiting, or we might call limiting their technology. I'm only going to look at how many 
steps I'm getting twice a day, once at lunch, once right before I take it off to go to bed, something like that. And so there was this process of um, gathering information about yourself that made you be a more effective consumer of that information. And that shift in those who were successful at it allowed that motivation to a little bit more naturally shift from extrinsic toward, toward intrinsic. Um, not to like take that for time, but to follow up, right? Like I work in data and I found that overwhelming, but I imagine the average person probably does too, and maybe isn't really self aware enough to do that. Or maybe we aren't, I'm not sure. But like our developers of that, like of these types of apps, are they aware of that and are trying different ways to push it? Like for anybody who's in company, is there different shifts that have to occur? So I guess to self-awareness piece was most effectively achieved through communication with somebody else. So all of our participants were talking with their health coach about that. And so collectively, they were able to see that, bring that to light, and then make changes. Um, in terms of the device company, I Yeah, I think the, like, speaking back to what Dr. Jacob asked me just a, a, a few minutes ago about what's changed over the last five to 10 years, uh, user experience is getting a little bit better, right? So typically, made the user experience a little bit better, whereas instead of you being able to, you can customize your settings, right? So you can go in and say, I only want to see this on this day, or I only want to see this once a day. Um, so you're not having to go in and actually do it, or you won't even have access to it, or it has to refresh at a certain point. But it's not, um, it's not our job as users to do that. It's Apple. Fitbit's job to make the user experience better um, to because to make to increase adoption um, because that's the thing that I saw in the research too. People were adopting these devices and then after a while they stopped using it because it just was becoming overwhelming. So a lot of companies, especially Apple, they're really being focused on their user experience and making things more usable, less overwhelming. Um, so for example, I trying to track my sleep at one point and I would have to go into the app every day and check it now if I hit a goal it sends me a notification if I don't get hit that notification obviously I didn't meet my sleep goal um, so uh, but it is a job it's not you know it's, it's not and that's what that's what the uh, that's why a lot of companies need to consider users in the design of these technologies to reduce the bandwidth developing these devices and people are using them and they stop using them. But I've noticed it too. They're just getting a lot better. So we want to give it another shot or pull one of those that you <laughs> <laughs> Alright. So we've had a couple more questions in the live uh, QA in the background, which by the way people can join there if you don't want to ask a question out loud. But in this space of measuring steps, tracking your data and all of that. One of the concerns is reliability. How much can you rely, or how accurate is the health data? What's the margin of error if you have that? Or just a simple question, how reliable is this technology that we're giving our data to? So I can say in, in some respects, some of the health data information reliability, again, in, in some spaces, it doesn't matter how accurate it is, at how accurate it is as long as it's internally consistent. So you're wearing the, the device day after day after day, and you know, your device is consistently telling you that you're getting 10% more steps than you actually are. It's gonna do that every day. So if you're comparing your one day to the next or your one month to the next, the actual accuracy may not be as important as the relative numbers for you against yourself. In terms of research, and uh, I, not that steps aren't important, but maybe uh, like blood pressure, we want that to be a very accurate measurement. That piece, uh, and we, we definitely care about the accuracy for a little bit more to be thinking about the accuracy. 
obviously of that information. So I think it's really important to the point made earlier about the user experience that we um, look at that, we um, really interface with the user and the customer and see like what's that experience like from their lens and also how are they using the technology and how is it worn. So if my band is like a little loose, is it going to be as reliable the reading that I'm getting? So being more attuned to that um, is gonna be important I think for the, the developers to look at. I also think um, with uh, the same like kind of thing, <laughs> they need to really, um, you know, have more conversations with the, the, uh, the users, the, the consumers, and interpret some of the data so that it makes sense for their user experience. So I think that companies um, have to look at different ways that we can interpret that data so that it's relevant to the person who's using it um, and that it makes most sense. Because if I overwhelm somebody with a lot of measurements and statistics about their health uh, information, it might be very overwhelming and have like a paradoxical effect on them. Whereas if we interpret that and give them a short little narrative about, okay, here's what it means for your specific um, person-centered experience, I think that would be very useful uh, for them to consider. And most of these devices aren't going to give you 100% accuracy, um, but I think you know as time and like advances, like you know, five years ago it may have been like 90% accuracy. Um, now it may be like 93% accurate. Um, so you're not going to get that full 100%. But if you're in that 90% range, you're going to have some accuracy. I know this on mine. I will go for a run. And it's kind of hard, you know, depending on the sensor, like, you know, and it's, and it's like, how is my device collecting steps if it's on my wrist? Shouldn't it be on my, my ankle or something like that? Um, you know, so it, it just depends on the accuracy of the devices. I think a better idea um, that these companies should potentially adopt is to create a network of devices. So if you do have one device, maybe you could like, if I wear a band on my, if what, it depends on what my goal is. So if my goal is, you know, I need to actively, more actively more monitor my heart rate. So I can wear a device on my wrist, but there may be something I can wear on my chest to actually more accurately detect my heart rate. Um, and those two things can kind of talk to each other and kind of collab and uh, calibrate to give me a more, a more accurate uh, more accurate measure. But again, they're not gonna give us 100% uh, accuracy at all. But I think, you know, closer, Thank you. Another question that the audience had was, um, which companies are leading the initiative to protect their customers' privacy? And then while you're at it, more of a futuristic question of which are the companies to kind of watch out for that are pushing this area forward? I guess, like wearables in general? Well, um, Apple um, makes the claim that they're really concerned with user privacy and they're doing their best to protect user privacy. Um, so I would say, um, as far as claims, um, Apple claims to be the company that cares most about user privacy. Show of hands, who knows who, own, who knows who owns Fitbit? Who owns a Fitbit? What they purchased by Apple? Google purchased Fitbit. So we know, and you know, I know this is recorded. I'm not gonna, but we know Google's history. Right. Um, so Google acquired Fitbit uh, a couple of years ago for over a billion dollars. It was a billion something. It was a really high number. So um, why did Google acquire Fitbit? Like, why would that even happen? Um, who knows? Um, but you know, Google has had its issues with data breaches. I think all of these companies have had issues with data breaches. But Fitbit. All of these companies are not making money by this piece of technology that we're wearing. What are they making their money from? The data. They're making their money from data. Um, so that
that's something that you have to you know, take into consideration. But Apple has claimed that they're you know, leading the, the, the privacy and security because they're the most secure. But you know, I don't know. I think we have to um, really understand the terms of service Research has shown like people don't really understand privacy policies. They said it would take some a lawyer over a week to fully go through uh, privacy policies and fully understand it. So somebody that's you know, doesn't really understand that technical jargon, or do we really understand what's going on and do we understand the consequences for what we're doing? But to answer your question, Apple claims that they are. So maybe they are. I hope they are because I have an Apple Watch on. Another audience question, how do wearables contribute to expanding and enriching remote healthcare? So, what I didn't mention earlier, I'm a part-time therapist. I work out of a group private practice. And so we have um, clients that see us for telehealth, for you know outpatient therapy. Um, and so I see them on the computer um, or tablet or cell phone. And so the functionality of that, it really makes therapy and counseling more accessible for people who really need it. And after the pandemic, there's been such a shortage in the amount of providers who are able to provide that essential service to folks. Um, and so making it accessible through telehealth has been huge. It's been a game changer in um, my region of New Jersey. Um, we've been able to reach a lot more clients that way um, who really need the service. And it's more convenient for their schedule. Um, I, have, I see a lot of college students um, in my practice and um, you know, being able to sign in from their phone or from their um, iPad has been very you know, convenient for them with the rest of their schedule and balancing work life and school. Um, so it's definitely made it more accessible and as a result, people are attending to their mental health, which is so important. Um, and I encourage you all to do that. <laughs> it's a really important piece of yourself um, self-care, your mental health is such an important thing that people often neglect, um, and it's so crucial um, to our wellness. And I'll, I'll answer this, Alex, and maybe speak more on this, but I think the potential um, for telehealth can be, it's a, it's a lot of potential there, right? But how are, like for example, if I'm feeling bad and I can't go to the doctor or Space, I could just send my data to my doctor. But who knows how to get their data off and, and convert it to a CSV file, upload that file, and send it to their doctor through a secure portal? Like the average person doesn't really know about that, know how to do that. Now, if, it's, if your doctor has a customized way or if they prescribe you a device, it may be a little bit easier. Um, so that's you know where the challenge is. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. may be some some applications um, that can be designed specifically for that but that also brings me to the question does an EMT when they show up for these types of things do they know that um, or you know like is it is it personalized so that's you know it just depends I guess if a person is prone to certain things like that their doctor may have a situation where they you know, kind of like life alert, right? So right. life alert. Or if the bracelets that people used to wear. They yeah. Just said, you know, to, alert. Right. You just get the bracelet, but it's still all part of what you're doing. So that may be able to assist them in a kind of intercessional version of that. Yeah. So yeah. So it could be a situation where 
if a person is subjected to something like that, it could be something on the device or some type of thing on the person's wrist to indicate to the person I have a issue. These are the things that you need to check. But how is you know how is a EMT going to be able to get that information off the device, or how are they going to know where to look for that? If it's a universal standard, right. So I guess coming back to the ideas related to telehealth and remote health care, uh, the, the study that we're running with, with Fitbit uh, and, and health coaching, we were conducting that 90% in person up until the pandemic. On a dime, we had to switch over to remote uh, remote coaching and kind of adopting that telehealth model. I will say having that data that you know, our participants were able to share with, with their coaches enabled fruitful conversations to continue to happen. Um, and not only did it increase access of new participants to be eligible or both eligible and able to commit to the duration of the study, but it increased compliance as well um, because it cut down on commute time. So previously, participants had to drive to, to campus. Parking was always an issue. They didn't like it. Um, and now they were able to, to then just pop on their computer phone, um, tablet, and gain instant access. The data still made its way and you know, provided, again, fruitful conversation um, during that, during those visits. You know, I think we talked earlier about the effect that the pandemic had on access and adoption of wearables. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, so in the pandemic, obviously, most of us had a lot of social isolation um, and spent time, a lot of time with ourselves and got to know ourselves families a little bit better. Um, but, you know, this all had access in different communities um, and the quality of education in those districts, it raises huge um, implications for people who don't have access um, or as high quality access as like a suburban district who has um, the resources and the um, ability to, you know, provide quality education to all of their students versus in a more rural area where there's limitations. Um, it continues to you know, perpetuate some of the disparities that we see, um, racial and um, equitable, um, you know, quality education for all is, you know, there's huge problems with that and with respect to the accessibility. Um, and so this opens our eyes really, I think we um, became more alert to some of the, the issues that need to be uh, worked on and addressed um, with respect to access. Questions from the audience before I move on to the room. Okay, great. Just want to make sure I didn't miss any hands. Um, so, in that space of, um, we talked about remote uh, access for um, different, differently developed areas. Um, could you talk about the interception? Sorry, the intersection between um, wearables and um, marginalized populations. Is there something that we need to be aware of there? What are our most critical changes that we need to make to face the future in an effective, progressive manner? So that's actually what my research agenda is. I'm trying to better understand user perception in terms of privacy on wearables among marginalized populations, specifically African American and black American populations. So we have these devices, right? So we know that these marginalized groups, specifically African Americans and Latinx, have the largest health disparities, um, meaning these people are getting sicker at more alarming rates than the normal population. So we have technology that could potentially come in and close this health disparity, right? But my research is showing that um, these individuals aren't adopting these devices. 
prices at a very high rate. Um, so something that could potentially save them, they're not adopting it, and why is that? Um, so Kevin haven't quite got to the point of answering why, um, but anecdotally, we could you know look into mistrust um, in healthcare systems. Government is just a mistrust. So, you know, something that potentially can help me, I'm not going to adopt it because there's a long history um, in this country of mistrust and um, just the discrimination against these groups in terms of health. So, um, you know, I think that begs the question of what do we do now? Um, better understanding these people's perception. And that's what my research is doing. Like, all right, you're not wanting to adopt it. Is it privacy? Is it associated with cost? Um, you know, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, accessibility, um, understanding utility of the device. Um, you know, is that related to the digital divide? Um, so, you know, if we have these technologies that can potentially save you, how can we design these technologies a little or better inform people from marginalized groups of actually what's going on and how can we better protect them and protect their information um, so they don't be Subjected as they have been in the future to um, racial discrimination in terms of, you know, from a health um, aspect. So, with that thought, from a homeschooling standpoint, it would seem that it would be really advantageous to figure out a way to be transparent or provide some transparency because this is a population you don't have data and you're not going to create the data, right? Um, have, are you aware of? Yeah, I think it's, I think companies should do that, but you know, like the standard user versus a user from a marginalized group, their experience is going to be a lot different. Um, so companies have to potentially bring in people from these groups or, you know, do studies or create user personas to better understand these groups and to better understand their experiences and design that technology around that experience. Don't, instead of designing the technology and figuring out, oh, this doesn't fit for this group, let's go back, like include them in the design process. Like for example, um, there's a lot of biases in a lot of these sensors, uh, these devices that collect information um, because they're not running tests on people from these marginalized groups. So you know, the way that the, the, the data is collected, the, the sensor um, based on your skin tone, it's a lot of different factors. I think companies should hire more people that understand these groups a little bit better or hire people from these groups um, that understand those experiences and that's why I'm trying to better understand this because I kind of can't relate um, to those things but I think it's from a company perspective I think that's something that they should do they should design you know they have this concept of you know privacy by design right um, so it's also inclusive design so how we do we can design more inclusive technologies for people from these Another um, aspect of this, I think it's closely related, is that um, governmental funders um, are requiring research to be more representative. So um, like the National Science Foundation and NIH, the National Institute for Health, are requiring people to have representative samples of people of minoritized communities, um, women, children, um, people from vulnerable populations. And so having those requirements, I think, will help us get closer to addressing these issues by forcing people who are designing these studies with us um, to include them in our samples. And I think representation in our sample and in our research is so important. And I think we're, we're getting closer to um, moving the needle in that direction. <laughs> yeah. So to wrap up, what recommendations do you have for users of wearables for someone who's considering a wearable, for someone who's a bit weary of wearables?
don't become like overly obsessed about it. I mean, just really like use it and see the larger picture. Um, I always tell my students to look at the macro level, right, and just see the bigger picture and how it fits into your life. Um, you know, if we too, if we're too focused on the immediate, what's in front of us, we're we're losing sight of the larger picture. And just use it as a tool to help you to lead you. Um, don't become fixated on it as being like the only measure of success. Um, and just I think that's really motivating and um, helps people um, use the technology in a way that advances them. Uh, from a privacy, from a security perspective, uh, there are some things that you could potentially do. Um, better understanding like what's collected um, and who that information is being, being shared with. Um, so there, you know, there are customization settings where you can go in and customize who this data is shared with. Um, you know, some people may be sharing all of their business data with everybody on every single social network um, that they are on. Um, a lot of this isn't done by default, but there may be something that happens. Um, so going in and checking your settings, uh, making sure your device is up to date, right? So um, a hacker could potentially create some form of malware um, that could potentially steal data from your device. Uh, but if your device and say Apple is aware that this malware is out, they'll create a new version of the software to defense against that threat. But if you haven't updated your device, you're not protected because your device is not up to date. So making sure your device is up to date, um, making sure your settings, your sharing preferences, your data is being shared with who you want it to be shared with um, and not being shared with everybody. Um, also um, understanding a little bit more about the terms and services of the companies I know it's probably going to be a little bit exhausting to try to read a privacy policy, um, potentially looking at you know, videos on YouTube or doing Google searches or something to try to get a more um, granular understanding of what's being collected and what's being done with that information to allow you to make more decisions. So um, those are just a few things, but I think um, you know, pre uh, awareness is the key, just knowing actually what's going on. Eventually, found out that you you've been breached, and it's too late. Somebody stolen your identity because you're oversharing information on a device that's supposed to be collecting stems. Um, so those are just some things to think about. And then I think another piece to be aware of is again understanding that user interface and getting familiar with what you're actually seeing versus what information is available to you. And again, if you want to do that deep dive, you can, but think about what the minimum effective dose would be for you to get the information that you need to make some sort of positive change, um, you know, whether that be for your education, um, for your privacy, for your health, et cetera. Thank you so much. Um, there are lots more questions to be asked, but what I will do now is just invite uh, the audience to stick around, especially if you have a question that you really wanted to ask our lovely panelists here. I want to thank every single member of the audience here. Thank you so much, and especially our um, audience that has joined via Zoom. Thank you. We couldn't have done this without the support of the Hinkleys. Thank you so much, and especially to Rosalind and also Lindsay for all of your work in the background. And would you all please join me in thanking our panelists for their time. Thank you again. Feel free to come up and talk to our panelists. We've got time. <laughs>